everybody. Today I have a, once again a very special guest. And now this is truly an amazing person that has created a product that's actually, I think, has started a whole new category. And we'll get to that in just a minute. So Travis, welcome to InventRight TV. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. All right. Before we start, let's talk about what you invented because it's around the world and I want people to, to really understand how big this is. So you invented, in fact, I went online because I had to do a little bit of homework here and I went online and it says the, it's the most used water bottle around the world, Hydro Flask. Is that correct? I mean, is that? I, I, I believe so. I mean, I, I do travel a lot and it is the water bottle that I see most. Absolutely. But okay, so you created this this water bottle, but it's much more than that, isn't it? Because I looked at the full range of products now that the, the company offers, and it's like a hundred different products that sold in seventeen different countries. So can we talk a little bit about what the product is and what it does? First one. Well, so it's basically a double wall vacuum insulated stainless steel water bottle. And I had found that uh, I, I wasn't able to keep water or ice to a temperature that I liked. I was living in the, uh, on the beach in Hawaii, and the water bottles just weren't doing what they needed to be doing at the time. And I remembered my grandpa had a, a, an old thermos that was glass and metal, and it was pretty okay, but that was like 1950s type stuff. And so I wondered why we couldn't just take metal and put it on the inside and metal on the outside and then put that vacuum flask into something that we could actually portably carry. Now, in a Travis, water wait a minute, wait a minute. This sounds very complicated. What's your background? I mean, you're, you're, you're over, you're, over, you're living over there in Hawaii and you come up with this idea do you have a background in manufacturing or metals? Um, I, no, none whatsoever. My closest metal background was um, scuba tanks and, and airplanes. I was a boat captain, a dive instructor, dive master. Um, I worked, um, I was a, a commercial airline pilot. I um, also had a fence company and we had metal posts for our fence, but that was about the closest I had. <laughs> So what do you do? You come up with this idea and you go, look, this technology is old thermos. I guess that's what we're talking about. It's old. It's tired. There needs to be something new. So where do you start? You have that aha moment. Where do you go from there? Well, that aha moment was um, it was it was really the starting point of a lot of um, just serendipitous events and coincidences that took place that just kind of propelled Hydroflask to market. Once, once I kind of once it came out of my mouth that I would do that, I would I would create something from nothing. Um, it just it just started happening on its own almost, and and I don't have a lot of great explanation as to how I kind of grayed out there for a number of uh, units of time. And, and it just sort of happened. I didn't have a lot of experience with even using Google uh, back then, 2007, 2008. I wasn't really computer um, fluent and definitely way before Alibaba and some of those, you know, type things were, were available. A lot of the Chinese weren't even on the Internet at that time. They didn't have they still don't have Google. And, and so it's hard for them even to find Americans to come and work with their factories. And so it was a lot of work. So wait a minute. Let's talk about that. How do you get the first one made then? I mean, did you did you travel over to the Far East or did you find a U.S. Uh, contract manufacturer to make that first prototype for you? How'd you do that? Do you remember? Well, actually, it became it became a bit of a challenge because I could not find anybody in China who was willing to work with me. At that time, they were doing aluminum water bottles and that was it. Um, there was one or two factories that were doing uh, single wall stainless steel uh, water bottles. And they told me, no, that they weren't interested, that there was no market, no way. People are just barely paying 20. They're not gonna pay 30 for a water bottle. And so it just kind of became a challenge. Like I started to just want to find somebody who would take a, take a risk on me. And I was able to find a, a trading company, which has a lot of inherent risk 
um, in and of itself, which I didn't realize for, you know, a number of orders later. And, and that's just, you know, they, they told me that they would take a chance and, and make us 3000 bottles. And um, they sent us a couple prototypes, which I didn't like, but everybody we showed just loved them. And they thought that it was the best thing that ever seen. And I thought it was awful, but it gave me incentive to create a, a, you know, additional versions. Okay. So how did you tell us about that first one you sold? Did you did uh, you walk into a a store and say, "Hey, look at this, carry it"? I mean, what was that experience, and how did you do it? Well, so the first um, we had ordered three thousand for for the first initial MOQ. The minimum order quantity they wanted was three thousand, and. We sold everything we owned to, I mean, literally down to the cutlery. We sold everything we owned, left Hawaii, moved into Bend with my mom, and um, we only had enough money for 1500 So we bought 1500 bottles and took them up to the Portland Saturday Market here in Portland, Oregon, and uh, showed up. And they said, oh, absolutely not. Nobody's going to want those. That's ridiculous. They cost too much. No. Um, so they, they told us no. The next day, went back on Sunday, because it's Saturday, Sunday, went back on Sunday and, and said, you know, please, can we just try to sell bottles and just let's see what happens? And they said, fine, you can go out by the railroad tracks and set up a table, but that's about it. So we went out there and set up a little table uh, next to the max. I mean, literally right next to the train. And it was about 100 degrees and we put ice in the bottles. And I just started throwing bottles at people with ice in them and they would open it up and just be amazed that there was still ice. And I remember the first guy who bought the first one, it was a black one, black 21 ounce. Um, he almost started crying at how excited he was and how just like, like his mind literally just popped. And it was like, okay, cool. We're on to something. And we sold enough that the following weekend, they allowed us to come inside and, and have a real booth uh, at the, at the market. Wow, that almost that almost gives me goosebumps because I started <laughs> I started my career selling things um, basically with the table just to see if people wanted it. So what a great test! Did you know at that point you had something? Because I know it's been hard. It, it had to be a struggle. You're you're you sold everything. You're probably doubting yourself along the way. How did you stay with it? I mean, how did you say, "Look, I'm going to keep doing this"? You know. <laughs> It, it was. It was extremely difficult and a lot of naysayers. But then when selling a product to somebody and looking in their eyes and, and hearing them give feedback, it wanted, you know, I wanted to sell two. I wanted to sell three. You know, it just started to compound. And um, and we had no other option. I mean, there was there was no plan B. It was we need to sell these bottles or else we're not going to eat tonight. Like it, there, there wasn't there wasn't any other option. Okay. So let's fast forward a little bit. Um, your business is going, I mean, there's a lot of ups and downs, I know, and I'm sure there's a lot of problems along the way. That sounds pretty normal. Everybody understands that. But you ended up selling it. You were at, how big were you and what year was it that you sold your company? And how did that feel when you did it? Was it a great day? Was it a sad day? Tell us about that. Well, I, I, yeah, um, there is a lot of backstory that sort of took place in, in my life, both professionally and personally. I had just got married. My brother had just died. Um, you know, we were going through just 600% a quarter growth. It was just outrageously, insanely big. And we'd always had a lot of issues with trying to finance the whole thing. So we started to take on investors. And I think taking on investors sort of opened my eyes and ears and heart up to um, different forms of business. And some I just didn't want to necessarily pursue. And others, you know, um, I, I, I admired them for doing it, but I didn't want to partake in. But I knew that if, if I stepped back and stepped out, that the legacy would continue. I, I had good, strong hope that um, the trajectory that they had planned for it was the same as my trajectory for the most part. What year was that, Travis? Was that um, 
That was uh, 13, 2013, 2014, right in there. Yeah, 2013, I think maybe in April. And how large were you at that point? Were you selling in a thousand stores or more than that? Oh, more than a thousand. Yeah, we were all over the country, all around the world. It was it was already really big. We were basically really big, really quickly. I mean, within the first six months, we were already starting to be sold on the East Coast, which you know was a big indicator that you know we had already grown from you know my mom's garage. How stressful was it? Uh, <laughs> uh, if I didn't have my motorcycle to just go ride off into the sunset every day, I, I would have been pulling my hair out. It was a lot of stress, but, um, you know, being a commercial airline pilot and a dive instructor and a boat captain, it, it kind of, you know, I've studied stress a lot and I've, I've been in stressful situations a lot and I've studied business a lot. And so, you know, it was a manageable stress and it was a feeder stress. I'm sure there's some psychological name for that, that it actually gave me mana. It gave me energy and power to, to continue. And then also just the stress of there is no plan B. This will work. Okay. How did you find those investors? Um, we knocked on a lot of doors because it was right in the middle of the recession and nobody had money, nobody had business, nobody had interest, nobody had anything, uh, you know, for anybody else, let alone themselves. And so we just started knocking a lot of doors. And that's, I think that's, you know, like a friend of a friend was the first one. The second big one was, was kind of a neat story. We were, it was a, a Wednesday afternoon and it was literally time to close down the doors. We had no more money. We just got in 40,000 rusted and potentially rusted and non-insulated bottles, just signed a five-year lease on 10,000 square feet, just hired more employees and we had no money and it was awful. And on, I remember sitting there Wednesday morning, starting to draft up, you know, I'm sorry, we're going out of business letter and a, the phone rang and from the front and she said, Hey, there's a guy here who wants to see you. And I said, I I'm sorry. You know, there is no more hydro flask, no reason to see me anymore. And she called back and said, no, he really, really, really wants to talk to you, Travis. I think you need to come up here. And I said, okay, fine. So we sat down and, and he said he wanted a job. And I said, well, I'm so sorry. You know, we're not hiring. And he, he just kept, kept at it. And I just kept telling him no. And finally, he said, well, why will you not hire me? I said, well, to tell you the truth, we're closing down Friday. He said, why? I said, I, we don't have enough capital to buy more inventory. And he said, well, what do you need? I said, million bucks. And he goes, oh, so if I got you a million dollars by Friday, can I start on Monday? And I said, sure. Yeah, that's, that sounds great. You know, and, and wanted to call security. You know, I was like, okay, whatever, dude. So he left, and sure enough, Thursday afternoon, about 3 o'clock, he called back and says, hey, can you meet with a buddy of mine uh, tomorrow morning about 10? And I thought, oh, geez, he wants me to hire his friend too. And I, and I said, no, you know, I'm sorry, I, I'm really not hiring. And he goes, no, this is some money. And sure enough, the next day, the, this man walks in, and he says, you know, what are you doing here? Let me see it. And we showed him, and uh, Cindy said – that she wanted, you know, $852,714.22 or whatever that number was. And I said, I just want to sell bottles. And he goes, so if I gave you a million dollars, would you be able to sell some bottles? And I said, yeah, a few. He wrote a check. <laughs> wow, what a great, great story. How large is the company today to 2020? Uh, uh, I mean, it's big enough that now they just don't even have a CEO anymore. It's just a big corporation. I mean, it's just all hell in a troy. It's, it's, you know, how, it's out there. Um, Travis, how did they keep your soul? Because looking at, looking at the website, looking at the products, there's, there's some magic there. So there's, there's a soul there. I can see it. Yeah. It, you know, it was built in the DNA. It, it was a, it's, it's almost a child or a living entity and the DNA that was born into Hydroflask still permeates today. I feel, you know, we were, um, we were real big into the surf culture when we were in Hawaii and, and real big into the sporting and athletic world, um, outdoor world when we were here in Bend. And, you know, 
I don't want to say all the products, but the vast majority of the products that they're still putting out today are the ones that I invented and drew up back in, you know, 07, 08. The technology by and large has not changed, nor have the designs. And so I think that's that's another kind of testament to they took my idea and they just continued it how I was hoping that it would be continued. So last question, what are you doing today? I, well, today I'm talking to you. <laughs> um, today I'm working with, um, with other companies to do pretty much the same thing. I do a lot of sourcing with China. I work with factories all the time, not only in China, but all around the world to help people bring their products and their inventions um, from the napkin stages all the way through to home delivery and, and mainly uh, product sourcing. And I'm also CEO of a couple companies and on the board of directors of others. And I'm still inventing and drawing up my ideas like mad, you know, probably two or three a day I come up with. <laughs> Your book was, was amazing. I, and, and I gauge a book by how many times I've underlined it and, and marked in it and written ideas in it and highlighted it. And yours is one of my most marked up books of all time. Um, and the, the one thing that I keep hiccuping on is the is around the contracts and, and getting the contracts written properly for licensing. Because I have so many ideas, but I just don't have the, you know, I just can't start up 150 different businesses. I, I need to start licensing them out. Well, Travis, thank you very much for, <clears throat> for taking us on this journey at the very beginning. And because I know there's a lot of people that are wondering, can I do this? And I, and I think you gave them inspiration today. Oh, well, I hope so. Good. It is possible. If I can do it, you know, no college education, no, no real formal training in any of this. I, I know others can as well. Yeah. All right. Travis, thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Mm -hmm.